So I'm going to talk about tropical cyclones. Um, I normally, you've, you've heard this before, I normally teach this over three weeks of lectures, so you've got a jam-packed hour coming up. Um, I'm going to try and give you a um, kind of a fairly good overview. I delve in a little bit to some of the details, um, but really I want to touch a little bit on the many various aspects of tropical cyclones, except I'm not going to touch on tropical cyclones and climate change, so don't, don't be disappointed when I don't get there because I'm not going to touch on that. Uh, there's just, I think we all agree to disagree on too many things associated with that topic to even try and, and put too many bounds around it at the moment. Um, but I did want to start off with this one really cool picture. Um, this, this really helps to highlight um, the phenomenal advance in observing their systems that we've made probably in just the last 10 or 15 years. Um, when satellites came on in about the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, that was a huge step forward for observing these systems because they spend most of their life over the oceans. And oftentimes we didn't even know they were there until they either ran into a ship or, or made landfall. Um, with satellites, now suddenly there was a jump in the numbers of tropical cyclones being recorded, you know, double in most basins, just because um, we were seeing them over the oceans for the first time. But now we have these polar orbiting satellites that give us these phenomenal views. And in this particular case, we had the great fortune of, um, with the MODIS, the satellite with the MODIS instrument on board it, um, actually managing to take three overpasses, consecutive overpasses, capturing the three tropical cyclones that were affecting the Southern Hemisphere, two affecting um, Australia, and then one out in the, um, the South Pacific. This is Olwyn, Nathan, and, and Pam from, I think, 2014? 2015. 2014. Um, but it gives you this beautiful, and, and the other thing that's actually quite phenomenal about this picture is that even with these polar orbiting satellites, it actually give us much higher resolution views of these tropical cyclones, and can also carry instruments that give us information on um, the structure beneath these clouds. Geostationary tends to give us what the clouds look like, but can't carry the heavy instruments, the microwave instruments, that tell us something about the structure underneath the clouds. These polar orbiting satellites can, but typically because they are orbiting the Earth rather than sitting in one stationary place above the Earth, uh, chances are that you're going to get a swath that cuts this thing through the middle. So you only get to see half of it. To actually get three consecutive passes that each of them got the tropical cyclone smack bang in the middle is just something that, that's unheard of. So a lot of what you're going to see today <coughs> um, a lot of it's from old data, um, a lot of um, sort of reiterating what's been said a couple of times, um, particularly Michael said it yesterday, was that a lot of what we know about tropical cyclones, we've known for decades, and some people are reinventing the wheel. Um, but then some of it we're finding out for the first time just because of these new observing instruments. So in terms of what I'm going to try and cover, um, keeping an eye on the time, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of the climatology of tropical cyclones, where in the globe they exist and what their, are their, some of their regional characteristics. I'm going to spend a little bit more time here than anywhere else, looking at um, just mature tropical cyclone structure. I'm going to delve into that in a little bit more detail. Then we're going to look at how they generally move, intensification mechanisms, um, a little bit about genesis. Genesis is a, is a hot spot of research. Um, some people think the problem is solved, some people don't. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a sense of, of what we do know about genesis or formation of tropical cyclones. I'm going to touch on this topic of extratropical transition because it's a huge topic all in its own right, but at least give you an idea of why this is important and then look a little bit at landfall impacts to, um, to finish up. So in terms of climatology, this is a, um, a picture um, showing you all the tracks that are on record from 1851 to 2006. Now, it's really this basin here, particularly near land, and this basin over here that has a lot of those records going all the way back into the 1800s. So there's a little bit of a skewed view here on how many have actually happened over that period. Uh, we wouldn't have records, for example, in this area going back beyond probably 1950 or so. Uh, not very good records. You, know, you see a lot of these tropical cyclones are over the ocean and just don't have any way of knowing what was out there. Um, but it does give you a really good idea of where they do happen and where they don't happen. Um, and you can produce this sort of picture for just a 20-year period, a 30-year period, um, any 20-year period, you'll get pretty much the same sort of picture. 
They don't happen on the equator, so you have this blank line through here. They pretty much don't happen in the South Atlantic or the Southeast Pacific, but they do happen everywhere in, um, in all the basins in the Northern Hemisphere, and they do happen in the South Indian Ocean and the Southwest Pacific region. Why don't they happen on the equator? Because you need Coriolis to have a tropical cyclone. So they don't happen on the equator. They don't happen over here um, or over here, mostly because the ocean temperatures are a little cooler, but also because the environmental conditions aren't very favorable. We tend to have a little higher vertical wind shear, um, which is also detrimental to the formation of tropical cyclones because it's detrimental to the formation of deep thunderstorms. And this gives you an idea of how we kind of um, uh, pass these basins out. <coughs> so if I'm talking about the West and North Pacific at all, this is the area, general area I'm talking about. This is the date line right here. You'll notice that there's this sort of odd thing going on here. Basically, the south, southern hemisphere does pass out into tropical cyclones in the South Indian Ocean and tropical cyclones in the South Pacific. But it turns out that Australia has WMO warning responsibilities for this region right here. And then Medio France takes care, take care of this, this region over here and Fiji and New Zealand share this region over here. Um, so Australia has this kind of interesting um, aspect of actually doing the warning and the forecasting for tropical cyclones um, in both the, the Pacific region, in uh, the northern end of Australia and also in the, the South Indian Ocean, Southeast Indian Ocean. On average, and this is from a study going well back 1968, Bill Gray is a, a very famous, uh, um, he's the grandfather of many of us in meteorology, if, if Herb Real and Charney and Rosby, some of the names you heard yesterday, are uh, the great grandfathers of us. Bill Gray is the grandfather of many tropical meteorologists. He just passed away a few, um, a couple of months ago, actually, um, at the ripe old age of 90 something. Still at his desk, by the way, which tends to happen to tropical meteorologists. They die at the desk pretty much. Um, and so he did this study of 20 years of, of tropical cyclone information and, and found that on average there's 80 tropical cyclones that form annually globally. It varies a bit. Some years there's been as few as 69, another year, another year there's been as many as 103. But it's actually amazing how stable that, that mean number really is. It's about 80, somewhere between 80 and 85. It hasn't changed very much over the decades. Um, some people link this idea to the fact that maybe there's something to do with tropical cyclones releasing instability in the atmosphere in the tropics and they're moving that instability into the mid latitudes. And so there's some kind of a clamp on how many that can actually be. Yeah. Does that, that stability that mean hold up in individual basins or you can see like one basin has a lot more? Obviously one, one basin has a lot more activity than others. And you see sea soils between basins. One might like the Atlantic has a little, there is an anti-correlation between the North Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific. So if the North Atlantic has more activity, the Eastern Pacific has less. Um, but, but in general, it, it averages out fairly well. Excuse me. Um, and some of that anti-correlation is also because you do see changes in formation and location because the cycles like end cycle. So in an El Nino, you'll tend to see formations further out into the central Pacific, and in Nino, you'll see them um, more to the western side of the Pacific basin. So you will see that. And that will actually affect the Australian region numbers because we have that cutoff right here. So El Nino, uh, El Nino formations tend to be out here, so you see less activity for the Australian region in El Nino, maybe typical. Formation locations are very much tied to the warmest ocean temperatures. So here I'm showing you the sea surface temperatures averaged over 30 years for July through September, Northern Hemisphere summer and Southern Hemisphere summer. Um, and you can see for the Southern Hemisphere, here are the warmest ocean temperatures, here are the genesis locations. And for, for Gray's study, Genesis actually, in this case, is, you're talking about a tropical cyclone of at least 17 metres per second. So these were tropical cyclones already. And they named systems, these locations, <coughs> these, these dot points, where the first became 17 metres per second. So very much tied to where the warmest sea surface temperatures are for the northern hemisphere, the same thing. Pretty much map where the warmest sea surface temperatures are for the northern hemisphere. And typically you see maximum activity in the late summer, early fall, because that's when those sea surface temperatures are maximised. Largest area and, and, and deepest heat content. 
tends to happen then. Yeah. I'll make these available by the way so you don't have to pass out everything that's up there. So, it's, it's, what's regarding the Alinea and La Nina? So, which side of um, <coughs> Australia is going to the Pacific area? side is stuck here. So far, but you do area. see an influence out here as well in the Indian Ocean. Um, but the main area that you see that influence is in the Pacific Ocean. So, both in the case of El Nino or El Nino? So, El Nino, they tend to be a little bit further to the east. Oh, and in the line of the other two. Right, forgot about that. Um, regionally, uh, the seasons look something like this, and these numbers, I'm not going to go through all these numbers here, but this is, a, like I said, I'm going to make these available. You'll be able to get them from the website, so you don't have to copy all this down. <coughs> um, focusing on this one, this one, this one, these are the four northern hemisphere basins right here. <coughs> Eastern and Central North Pacific are, are locked together. Um, so just a couple of sort of distinguishing characteristics. For the North Atlantic, you have a very distinct peak in activity right around the 10th of September. So if you ever want to go fly a hurricane with the hurricane hunters, go to Miami on the 10th of September and you've got a pretty good chance that there'll be a hurricane out there that you might be able to get on a plane. A um, little bit more spread out in the activity for the Eastern Pacific. This, this, this is swamped by the Eastern Pacific activity. Um, um, and basically the peak's running from June, July, August, September. The Eastern Pacific. July, August, September is probably the main activity. Same thing with the Western North Pacific. The main months are July, August, September. But the Western North Pacific is distinguished by the fact that it's had tropical cyclones in every month of the year. It has such a big, warm pool of ocean temperatures in the Western North Pacific that as long as the environmental conditions are right, you can get tropical cyclones forming in any month of the year. It also has the largest activity or the highest activity, um, about 26 per year, as many as uh, in the 30s some, year, some years. Uh, get a lot of super typhoons in the Western North Pacific. Um, <coughs> So it's the most active ba basin. The eastern North Pacific is the second most active basin, and it's distinguished by the fact that it has the densest number of tropical cyclones, um, most in a kilometre square area, and it's right off the western, uh, off, right off the west coast of Mexico, is where they all are. So if you want to go and fly tropical cyclones to a field experiment, that's a great place to go because you don't have to fly too far; they're all right there, and you're, you're most likely to get them. Um, North Indian Ocean doesn't have very many, about four per year. Um, that's split between the um, Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. Um, it is distinguished, if you want to think of it that way, by the fact that the devil cyclones form there or have formed there in the North Indian Ocean. Um, if you look at the Southern Hemisphere, <coughs> with, these are split up into the um, Australia and the South Pacific all of the South Pacific region, plus a little bit of the Southeast Indian Ocean, and then we've got the Southwest Indian Ocean here. So the main activity here is January, February, March. Um, same with the Southwest Indian Ocean. Um, there's a little bit of a lull for the Australian region, and that's because the monsoon tends to move over land. And then once it comes back off land again, um, you get another secondary peak in the tropical cyclone activity in the Australian region. <coughs> When we look at the structure of tropical cyclones, you can see a lot of what we expect to see from satellite. Um, so I'm going to start there. Um, we're looking at infrared images here. You can see the clear eye, the very mature tropical cyclone here. You can see the clear eye surrounded by the eye wall, and you can see the spiral rain bands extending out from this particular hurricane. Um, a lot of the structure is obscured by cirrus, high-level cirrus, um, that's, that's up at the tropical forest level. So, so it is a little difficult to see a lot of the, the detailed structure that's underneath this. Um, the same thing for this one. Uh, it's going the other way. Why is that? Yeah. <coughs> so um, cyclonic vorticity is negative in the southern hemisphere. So they turn clockwise in the southern hemisphere. The Coriolis um, counterclockwise in the northern, sorry, anticlockwise in the northern hemisphere. When you look at radar, you can see a lot more, of, or if you look at microwave imagery as well, you can see a lot more of the convective structure that's obscured by the cirrus here. Um, so we're looking at a loop here. I can't remember which tropical cyclone this is. This is Taiwan here, and we're seeing this from the Taiwanese um, radar. 
Um, but you can see the clear eye surrounded by a very intense um, band of thunderstorms in the eye wall and then all these spiral bands. And you can also see that there's actually very clear areas between the spiral bands that we call mergence. It's kind of obscured by the, the cirrus in the infrared image. Ah, keep forgetting. Okay. <coughs> we look at the wind structure or the kinematic structure. I'm going to jump to another slide after this. So this is just setting up how we're going to, to look at these things. When you look through, um, so this, these are cross sections, running your legs through a hurricane from an aircraft, um, and it's measuring the wind speed. You can see that about this point here, there's pretty good symmetry on the side. There's, there's a little bit of asymmetric structure, it's a little bit different on the other side, but it's pretty good symmetry. And we can, in fact, approximate <coughs> our tropical cyclone as an axisymmetric system or a wave number zero system with, <coughs> with higher order asymmetry superposed. And it becomes very convenient to do that because we can think about doing things like doing azimuthal averages um, centered on the center of the tropical cyclone and just looking at what the basic structure looks like. And then we can look at how the actual structure different, uh, different, you know, is different from that. But we can get a pretty good idea of what the basic structure looks like by doing these azimuthally averaged height radius cross sections. So we're going to look at some of those as we go forward. And that's what we're basically doing is we're doing it at each radius, we're doing an azimuthal average of the values and then just plotting on here. Okay. We're also going to look at cylindrical coordinate systems centered on the tropical cyclone center for the same reason it's very convenient to do everything in a cylindrical coordinate center uh, system. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the full wind and we're going to decompose it into a tangential component and a radial component. Um, so we're going to split out the wind circulation of the tropical cyclone into its, its tangential or primary circulation component and its radial or inflow in or out. Um, circulation um, and see what this means for the tropical cyclone. So keeping the same pictures, <coughs> start off looking at, um, let's look at this composite cyclone. So this is an azimuthally averaged um, height radial <coughs> cross section. It is made in the composite of many, many uh, flights through tropical cyclones in the western and north Pacific that were done. They used to do aircraft reconnaissance there in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And this is a composite made up of all of those flights. Um, so you can see a very base, basically what the structure of the mature tropical cyclone looks like here. Um, this is the center of the cyclone. You won't see a lot of detail right in at the center because when you composite many, many different cyclones, they're all a little bit different in size, and so the average tends to smear out um, some structure, particularly the detailed structure right in at the core. But what you can get a sense of is that, first of all, the strongest winds are in here near the center, and they drop off with radius, and this is a thousand kilometers out here. Um, the, the very strongest winds are just above the boundary layer, just above the frictional boundary layer. In the, fr in the frictional boundary layer, the winds decrease a little bit because of loss of friction. They're pretty um, constant, up to about 500 hectopascals in the atmosphere. So it's kind of a barotrophic structure up to about 500 hectopascals. And then they drop off very rapidly with height, but they're still cyclonic all the way up to the tropopause. If you start to up here, if you go out from the tropopause, they do turn, this is this, this solid line here is indicating the zero line. So they do turn anticyclonic about 100 kilometers or two, between 100 and 200 kilometers from the center. They turn from being cyclonic to anticyclonic, but they are all outflow up there, outflow winds up there. And you'll get to see that in the next, next slide. When we look at a more detailed picture here, and this is a number of different legs that the plane took through Hurricane Wilbur, just plotted on top of each other. You can see that going out, so this is the center, winds are near zero at the center. Not necessarily perfectly zero, but very near zero. They increase linearly up to some maximum. They drop off exponentially. They increase again to some lesser maximum, and then they drop off exponentially again. Okay. And it does the same thing on both sides. And pretty much all the legs do the same thing. They vary a little bit in detail. Um, there's a little bit of whoops, noise in there. Come back here. Thank you. A little bit of noise in there, but basically they're doing the same sort of thing. Okay. So this is the center. What's this? Anyone know? Where do you have the maximum winds in the tropical cyclone horizontally? Yeah. In the eye wall. In the eye wall or just outside the eye wall. 
so that's where you have the maximum winds, and that radius of those maximum winds we call the radius of maximum winds, just to be different. <laughs> then it drops off, and then we have this next little maximum. What's that? What do you think that might be? Rain band. Yeah, absolutely. So you have another little wind maximum in the rain band, okay. and then it drops off again. If you had more rain bands, then you'd probably have other little maximums as you went out. You have that on both sides in this case. Hurricane Gilbert was a very intense, very symmetric tropical cyclone. Okay. Secondary maximum in the principal rain band. In fact, I said it right there. So if you're reading ahead, you could find that anyway. Again, maximum winds near the surface. Okay. <coughs> the other two components of the wind, the radial component of the horizontal wind and the vertical wind, go together to comprise the secondary, what we call the secondary circulation, which is the in if you put this, added this to this, you'd have the in, up, and out circulation. Um, <coughs> yes. Much weaker than the primary circulation. The majority of the full wind speed or magnitude is in the tangential wind or the primary circulation. It's a very small component. That's the inward um, radial component of the wind here. Um, but you do get a slightly stronger inflow in the boundary layer, and that's because friction causes the winds to turn a little bit more strongly inward towards the low pressure at the surface. So you have fairly strong inflow in here in the boundary layer. You have a deep region of much weaker inflow in the mid-levels of the troposphere, and you have this very narrow region of outflow up at the tropopause. In the vertical motion, you have saturated ascent in the eye wall. You have a little bit of subsidence in between the eye wall and the first primary rain band. Weaker up, um, upward flow or vertical motion in the rain band. And then very weak um, descent over a large area outside of the tropical cyclone itself. So again, together, these comprise the secondary circulation. This is how the cyclone gets its energy. This, this air is drawn in from the environment. It's drawn in from very far out, very slowly. It swirls around and around and around and around and around in the, in the, um, in the boundary layer into the centre of the tropical cyclone before it finally gets lifted up in these, in these thunderstorms. As it does that, it does supply angular momentum and thermal energy, which intensifies or at least maintains the primary circulation against frictional dissipation. So that secondary circulation is very important to keep the, the primary circulation going. Tropical cyclones come in all shapes and sizes. Um, there's no one size fits all, all, and this really illustrates that. Super Typhoon Tip was a monster, and this is a relative picture of it against the United States, 48 contiguous states, which is basically the same area as Australia. Um, 2,000 kilometres in diameter. It's also the most intense tropical cyclone on record, and that was observed by um, aircraft, so we have a lot of confidence in that. Um, it had a central pressure of 870 hectopascals, which was almost beaten this year, last year in the Eastern Pacific, but not by two more hours. It wasn't. Against that, you have tropical cyclone Tracy, which is the most infamous of Australian cyclones. Um, it was a midget labelled a midget tropical cyclone, its entire circulation pretty much fits within the radius and maximum wind spot tip. But it was a category four, so a very severe tropical cyclone. And of course, you realise that size doesn't necessarily, in, in some of my lectures I actually I talk about how size does matter. But in this case, size doesn't necessarily matter or tell the whole story because Tracy just hit the wrong place at the wrong time um, and caused massive damage. Kerry is much more of a, an average size, so you kind of get an idea of, of the, um, the range there. <coughs> Just because I can't let Michael beat me, I have to put some equations up. Okay. <coughs> um, but you'll see how, how neat this illustrates some, some points. So if we're going to work in cylindrical coordinates. Um, we can write the thermal wind equation in cylindrical coordinates as this is just a balance between the three forces. So we have cyclostrophic force, this is the tangential wind radius. Coriolis, this is the Coriolis force, you have Coriolis times tangential wind, and it's equal to the um, pressure gradient in terms of radius. It's just G potential. Um, but you can rewrite this as pressure. So you can rearrange this by taking dvz of both sides. This is a, that's meant to say tape, not top. Um, you can do this as a simple algebraic exercise. It's actually a good one to do. Take dvz of both sides and substitute this in and you'll get this relationship right here. 
This is now giving you a relationship between the vertical wind shear in the tropical cyclone and how the temperature changes with radius. So it's just another way of writing the thermal wind equation. But it tells us, we can, we can use this to tell us something about the thermal structure of the tropical cyclone. For tangential wind decrease, this is positive, this term is positive, and this term here is positive. So if we have tangential winds decreasing with height, which we saw in that um, composite view. So tangential winds decrease with height. This is a negative term. That means we have to have, with increasing radius, this would be a positive term. This has to be a negative term. That means the temperature has to decrease with increasing radius. So that tells us that for the wind structure we know a tropical cyclone has in the vertical, we must have warmer temperatures inside than on the outside. It's a warm core system. That's what this equation tells us. The tropical cyclone is warmest at the centre, it's a warm core system. <coughs> if you start from the fact that it's a warm core system, then you can tease out the fact that it has the strongest winds at the surface, as opposed to if those of you that know mid-latitude cyclones are the opposite, they're cold cored, strongest winds are up at the tropopause. Okay. So the strongest winds are at the surface. We can do a scale analysis, just like Michael did yesterday. We're going to rearrange the equation a little bit so that dt is off by itself and everything else is just moved to one side. And then we can do a scale analysis <coughs> where v is scales as u. I'm going to come back to these numbers in a minute. v scales as u. r is the length scale, or length scale scales r. Coriolis scales itself. And this is just um, the scale height, 10 kilometers. It's actually going to, um, this actually, um, what do you call it? goes away with that, cancels <coughs> with that. Okay. We're going to look at lengths that are appropriate to the inner core of the tropical cyclone. So we're within 100 kilometres of the centre of the tropical cyclone. Oops, which way did I go there? Okay. Coriolis in the tropics is about 5 by 10 to the minus 5 per second. And then our, um, our U is about 50 metres per second. So this is a pretty strong tropical. And we go ahead and we put in our scale units in just in place of these. So we have 2U on L plus F here. U on H, L, H on R, which is right here. And those two cancel. And we can just plug in the values here. So we have 2 by 50 on. We have to make sure our units are right. So we have to convert kilometres to metres. Okay, plug the values in. R is the gas constant for dry air. So it's 287. And we multiply that together, we get a temperature perturbation of about 17 degrees centigrade. For a very pretty strong tropical cyclone. Well, this is um, a fairly famous set of analyses of observations that were done in the 60s through Hurricane Hilda in 1964. I'll talk about the problems with this in a minute, but first of all, we're going to take note of the fact that the temperature perturbation is 16 degrees centigrade. It scales pretty well with that back of the envelope um, calculation. Um, <coughs> take notice that the so that the temperature anomaly is high up in the atmosphere. <coughs> it's not all the way at the tropical pause. It's about 250 to 300 hectopascals in the atmosphere. This is you actually want to have the warmest core quite high up in the atmosphere. Hydrostatically, that gives you a very low low pressure. It's the highest low pressure, the lowest low pressure at the surface. Um, you can see a couple of other things. This is the wind structure through that same um, uh, extent of the atmosphere. You can see that you've got very strong winds, 100 metres per second winds, um, right in very close to the centre, which is right here, the cyclone. A little bit asymmetric, but you've got 90 metres per second on the other side. But it's not, so it's not that asymmetric. Those winds are fairly constant, going up to 600 hectopascals, 600, 500 hectopascals or so, and then they drop off quite quickly. Um, notice that where you've got the strongest winds, which is up to about 600 or 500 hectopascals, the temperature anomaly, which does extend all the way down to the surface, is quite constrained. See how it's, it's quite it's constrained here. This is where you have very high inertial stability. That means you have a lot of resistance to horizontal motion. Where you have very strong rotation, you have high inertial stability and, and strong resistance to, to horizontal motions. So when you develop temperature, warm air here, it can't disperse out very easily. It's constrained to stay within that, that volume. Up aloft, however, even though the winds are still quite strong, 
they're weaker, initial stability is a lot lower, and you see a lot more dispersal of the temperature anomaly a lot. Okay, so you tend to see the temperature anomaly spreading quite out quite far at upper levels. Problems with this particular analysis are that here is one flight up here. Here's the next nearest flight. So how do they get this? So there's a little bit of imagination that's gone into this analysis. Okay, just a little bit. And everything up here that dashed, this is all extrapolated up the top. There's nothing to constrain um, what they've done up here. But this is at least constrained, it's interpolated. Um, it's interpolated, it isn't extrapolated. Okay. But it, there's a little bit of imagination going in there. When I say imagination, I mean based on their expert knowledge. Okay. That sort of imagination. <coughs> oh, the other one I just wanted to point out, because I've really just muttered this and I haven't really explained it. I'm not going to explain it, but I'm going to show you. This is showing you, because this is in terms of pressure here, this dash line here shows you that you have lower pressure at the surface. This pressure is about 950 hectopascals or so at the surf in, in the centre here at the surface. So, since when is that in shape being shown to Yeah, yeah we've got some observations now. That's some uh, really neat observations just um, taken in the last year um, by, um, they now use, <coughs> they still use aircraft to take observations a lot, but now they've been experimenting with some of these um, larger UAVs, the Predator, it's called the Global Hawk, and we're doing it for science, rather than for other stuff. Um, and they've been flying those at very high altitude um, over these systems. Um, and they got, um, the second most intense drop was I find on record was measured last year in the Eastern Pacific, and they actually had a drop sign in it from, from one of these UAVs. Um, and, it, and it had a lot of drop signs around it, so they did actually very nicely map out this same sort of structure. Yeah. In general, this is just the composite view of the same thing, <coughs> again, with many, many tropical cyclones going into this, but you see that, the, see that the basic same structure exists. Warm core is up at about 200, 250 hectopascals. There is this cold anomaly aloft, which wasn't showing in that previous slide. What might that cold anomaly be due to? What happens out of the tops of clouds? Radiation. Radiation or cooling. Yeah. So this is <coughs> most likely due to radiation or cooling. So you've got a lot of cirrus up here that's radiated or cooling. Just one little, little note on kinematics. Um, <coughs> talking about scales in the tropical cyclone before we move on to the next topic. Tropical cyclones really neatly um, separate into a couple of different regimes depending on what part of it you're looking at. And, and the, the wind field kind of showed that out. Out to the radius of maximum winds, we had kind of a linear increase in the winds out to the radius of maximum winds in that Gilbert structure. And then it dropped off exponentially outside of that. So we find that <coughs> when we do scaling, excuse me, we need to um, do balance of forces a little bit differently in the inner core of the tropical cyclone than we might do in the outer parts of the tropical cyclone than we might do in the environment. We can use this Rosby number that Michael talked about yesterday in order to do that. Remembering, just remembering that the Rosby number tells you something about the ratio between the centrifugal acceleration and the Coriolis acceleration. So if it's about one, it means that these two are equally important, and that's when you have gradient wind balance. Okay. Turns out that this is true in the tropical cyclone outer region, the centrifugal and the Coriolis acceleration are about as important as each other. This is 100 kilometres out to four or 500 kilometres in the tropical cyclone. So then your gradient wind balance applies where you have, uh, you have um, a cycle, you have a, sorry, centripetal acceleration, you have Coriolis, and you have gradient, um, pressure gradient. In the core region, though, the centrifugal, because the curvature is so great in the core region and the winds are so strong, centrifugal acceleration is many orders of magnitude greater than Coriolis. So the R naught ends up being much greater than 1 um, in the core region, again, inside the radius of maximum winds. And so you tend to have cyclostrophic balance in there. You neglect Coriolis, it's just not important compared to the other two terms. Um, and so you can then approximate what's going on inside the radius of maximum winds by cyclostrophic balance. I actually use these equations in an assignment in my class to have um, students calculate um, various terms. 
um, you just really get stuck with this. And then um, if you're out in the environment, then you don't have any centrifugal acceleration. There's no curvature to be talking about. Balances between Coriolis and pressure gradient force. And so you have geostrophic balance, except as Michael pointed out, pressure gradient is so weak in the tropics that ge ge geostrophy just doesn't really work very well anyway. Um, but, but you can kind of think of it as being quasi-geostrophic balance as long as you take divergence into account because divergence is much more important than um, the pressure gradient force in the, in the benign tropics, or the <coughs> ambient tropics. Okay. But these three, these three regions scale out quite nicely. <coughs> So any questions on that before I move on? I'm just blowing you with Russian jewels. What's that? The bus equation is getting starting with the center and you keep going, keeping this approach to the equator. Is that is it just falling apart because you get outside areas from the different material? So the center towards the equator? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, what would happen if a tropical cyclone approached the equator? No one really knows because you don't expect it to cross the equator and turn around go the other way. It would, as it approaches the equator, it's not going to just fall apart. Um, but yeah, what happens? It never has happened, and there's probably some sort of dynamical constraints that can cross the equator. But yeah, that is a question that people have said. No one's ever tried to. I don't think anyone's even tried to do it or successfully done it in a model. <coughs> okay. So, in terms of motion, tropical cyclones move generally um, in pretty prescribed um, directions. Um, they develop in the easterlies, the tropical easterlies, and so they move pretty much westward as a general concept. Uh, and I'm using those terms very strongly a general concept. Um, if they, this is an example from the Atlantic, North Atlantic, I, I thought about flipping it upside down so it would be the Southern Hemisphere, but that's a bit tacky, really. Um, if they're a little bit, located a little bit further south, <coughs> then they're more likely to track kind of westward, maybe move a little bit poleward, make landfall at some point and dissipate. If either they just form a little bit further north, poleward, I should say, or it's a bit later in the season so that the arachnid zones moved a little bit closer to the equator, migrated a little bit closer to the equator, then they're more likely to get caught up by the, the, the steering flow around the subtropical region and do something like this, and then they'll recurve back. And sometimes they can do this extratropical transition thing that I'll talk about briefly later, and make it all the way back across the basin and hit the other side, a continent on the other side of the basin with pretty severe weather. Extratropical transition, recurving, or pretty straight sort of westward motion. Except in the North Indian Ocean, where they go pretty much northward. Um, and, except for the ones that don't. <laughs> which is the ones where we get the big track areas. Um, yeah. this, is, this is a picture that's been put together specifically to make that point. I didn't go, have to go very far here to find these. So. Mm -hmm. Pretty squirrely trucks. Little loop-de-loops. Cute things, goes back on itself, uh, goes this way. I mean, that, oh my goodness, that one went here, here, here. Back there, over there. Oh, okay. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. And why do they do that? <laughs> There's some. Um, I'm going to have to bring that back up again so I can say that again after I've talked for a minute. So you have some basic controls on motion, it includes the environmental steering, um, it includes interactions with other weather systems. So <coughs> what you're seeing here is actually a calculation of the average deep mean layer winds in the atmosphere out to about 1,000 kilometres from every grid point. So it's just an average of the environmental winds. And what you saw, the tropical cyclone symbol, it basically propagated with whatever the direction <coughs> of that mean flow was. It's a, it's a, actually it can be a pretty good you know, 80 to 85% of your track forecast and often be done just by calculating what the steering winds are doing. But then you can get interactions with other weather systems, and one of the most classic or famous of these is when you get two tropical cyclones pretty close together. Um, and then the circulation of this one is going to impart a motion on this one in this direction. This is in the northern hemisphere, so they're going this way. So it's going to impart a motion on this one. But you have to add to everything else that's going on. These are all vector additions. 
And this one, which is going, has a circulation like this, is imparting a motion on that one in that direction. So if you separate out everything else, minus out everything else, and calculate just what's going to happen if these two are interacting with each other, then this one is going to go in a spiral like this, and this one's going to go in a spiral like this. And because they're, they're vortices with a vortex gradient associated with them, they're actually going to propagate inwards on those vorticity gradients as well, and in the end they're going to spiral in and smash into each other. And because they're a fluid, they're going to merge together. They're not going to explode or anything. But they'll merge in together. <coughs> one will get probably absorbed by the other because they're never quite equal. But usually something else happens, um, some other steering effect takes place. You've still got some sort of basic motion on these going in this direction. There's probably a subtropical high or a mid-latitude trough or something up here that's going to also affect that. So they'll come in, they'll spiral for a bit and then they'll escape and run away and do something else. The earth vorticity gradient is also pretty important for the same reason. So there's because of the Coriolis, the change in Coriolis with latitude you have an earth vorticity gradient that is going to do basically the same thing. Um, there's all sort of mathematical explanations about what's going on, but basically a vortex, a cyclonic vortex, is going to propagate towards higher vorticity. So it's going to go in this direction, towards the pole, in the southern hemisphere it's in that direction, because of the earth vorticity gradient alone. And then some of those little small scale trichoidal oscillations can be because you have something like some asymmetric convection in the circulation. And this is going to, when you have asymmetric convection, you have convergence of the surface and divergence aloft just associated with that convection. That's going to cause low pressure at the surface, just where that convection is, relative to where the tropical cyclone centre is. That causes positive vorticity tendencies, and so the tropical cyclone centre is going to tend to propagate towards that. That's going to give it just a little small scale of selection. If this is big enough and lasts long enough, then it can be a more long-lived kind of a, a, a track meander or track oscillation that goes on. So it's kind of giving you an idea of what causes large-scale motion, what causes little asymmetries on those large-scale motions. <laughs> Any questions about that? Clear about whether it's, say, a westerly wind burst, or it's that was just talked about earlier, or whether it's um, the actual circulations of the tropical cyclones themselves that are causing that motion. Intensification <coughs> and maintenance. Once a tropical cyclone forms, it's pretty clear that it gets its energy from the oceans. They form where there's warm oceans. It's clear that the oceans play a role in that. And the air that keeps the um, <coughs> excuse me, tropical cyclone energised is brought in in the inflow layer from far distance. Okay, so it does come out from the ambient tropics and it's brought in in the inflow layer and this, it's very large scale convergence that goes on into these systems. Um, it brings in ambient tropical high fever E air at the surface and it goes up in these clouds and it goes back out in the outflow layer. As these parcels come in in the inflow layer though, so they've got maybe ambient tropical fever E air about 300 the first thing that happens is because of friction, it loses any momentum. So that's why when these parcels do go up in the up in the thunderstorms and go back out in the outflow layer, they end up turning anti cyclone. They don't conserve angular momentum because of the friction in the boundary. So they lose angular momentum, but they also cool as they go in towards the lower pressure at the centre because they're able to add a bit of standing. So they actually cool. So effectively they have less energy once they get into the centre of the tropical cyclone than they did when they were out in the environment. So really once the air parcel gets in here to the, um, the centre of the cyclone, it hasn't got a lot to offer when it goes up in those thunderstorms in order to maintain that, that warm anomaly a lot. It hasn't got a lot to offer. 
So the energy that's lost has to be replaced somehow. Otherwise, when the air is lifted up in deep convection, it's really not doing anything to maintain that warm core. If you don't maintain that warm core, you don't maintain the primary circulation, the low pressure below, that keeps the convergence happening. Okay. And the answer is that because they form over the warm oceans, it's something to do with ocean fluxes. So what happens is as the air, air flows in, loses energy to friction, it loses energy to adiabatic expansion, but it picks up energy from the very warm oceans in that case. And the greater the difference, the more energy it picks up, the more flux comes from the ocean. Sensible and latent heat fluxes, so both sensible heat and moisture is picked up by the air passes. By the time they get into here, and for that, was it Hilda? There's another case that's very similar to Hilda that I didn't have time to show you, but I've got a piece of E cross section of it. The air in here, it's been brought in here at the surface has risen about 15 degrees Kelvin, 15 degrees Kelvin. So it's picked up a lot of energy compared with what it was out here as it's flowing in through the boundary layer, just from surface heat fluxes. That air then is lifted up in thunderstorms and redistributed up aloft, um, maintaining the warm core. When you do that, when you do back the envelope <coughs> calculations for that, <coughs> if you lift it in the most energetically efficient way possible, moist adiabatically to the upper levels, and redistribute that heat, you can get values for about 365 Kelvin, you can get a central pressure of about 960 hectopascals. We know that tropical cyclones get to be much more intense than that. So there has to be something else going on. Once you've, once you've, um, uh, where am I? Once you've, um, you've reached this value, you, you can't be any more efficient with this particular process, there must be something else going on to get your more intense tropical cyclones. The second mechanism that kicks in is the eye forms. You typically see this around um, about around 33 meters per second of intensity. It you know, varies a bit. Um, we're not completely sure because often the first processes of eye formation are cirrus obscure in the satellite, so it's not completely obvious, but somewhere around here we start to see eye formation. When we do that, we get subsident air in the eye. Air warms by compression. And so now you, you add considerable heat to that eye. Anomaly. And the back of the envelope comp, uh, calculation tells you that a subsidence, you can plug it into the equations, a subsidence of about minus two centimetres per second can give you as much as eight degrees C per day. So this, um, this also pushes the warm core anomaly that we would expect to actually be up at the tropical cores level when you've got this massive lift, lifting going up in these deep convective clouds, it actually gets pushed down a little bit and that's why we actually observe it between about 200 and 300 hectopascals because the subsidence is also actually pushing the core down a little bit. This additional warming means that we can get much lower central pressures. Okay. Any questions about that? That's about all I'm going to say about intensification. Yeah. From where does the mass come in? What's that? In the inner core of the cycle, uh, the mass is sucked from the lateral sides. From the radial inward, <coughs> the mass is sucked in from yeah. the radial inward side. Okay, so mass is sucked in from here, yes, and, and, and expelled, and yes. then a little bit is sucked in here, not a lot, just a little bit, oh. and this entrains back into the eye wall. Okay. So this, this here, it can get down to about 850 hectopascals, it'll sink down to, and then it gets entrained back into the eye wall. Oh, so the amount of mass is not large, but the velocity is large. Yes. yes. And this, if you're not, it's a good point that the amount of mass that you're bringing into the cyclone, if that is more than the amount that's going up top, then you're going to put a hold on intensification. Right? You can't bring in more mass than you're expelling that kind of thing. So that is actually a limit on intensification. Um, the amount of mass that you bring in at the bottom compared with what you're pushing out at the top. As long as you've got more going out the top than it's coming in the bottom, you'll continue to intensify after some time. Like I said, the details of tropical cyclogenesis is still a, a, a matter of debate. Um, there is a lot of work that's been done on it recently, a lot of good work, and we're really starting to understand some of the mechanisms that are at least important in tropical cyclogenesis. What I'm going to give you a feel for today is just really what the issues are, and then what do we know, what, what do we think we do know, as apart from what I think I do, I know, and everyone else is wrong. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that to you. <coughs> so I want to give you a feel for what the issues are, 
<coughs> so what I've given you here is kind of a timeline of tropical cyclone intensity. Once we get to a tropical depression, so tropical depression is, is a system that is less than 17 metres per second surface sustained winds, and we're not, it depends on what part of the world you're coming from, how you measure that 17 metres per second, it might be a 10 minute mean, a 1 minute mean, a 3 second gust, and there's, there's all sorts of different measurements out there. It's less than this, but it has some sort of a close circulation, so it's more than zero. This, this is suggesting that you have, a, you have a close circulation and there's a wind that's you know, 17 meters per second here. Here it's less than 17 meters per second, but you do have a close circulation. We think that that needs to be about 10 meters per second for that to, to have a fully close circulation. And the difference between this and this also is that here the convection, even if there's sort of some organized convection in there, it's, it's out to the sides, it's not centrally organized. Whereas here you can see the convection is centrally organized. So that's what makes a tropical depression compared with a tropical disturbance. And of course, then the thing intensifies into various different categories. Genesis processes are kind of going on in here. And there's a whole mixture of large scale, mesoscale, small scale, interactive types of processes that need to be going on to turn this, and they have to interact and cooperate to turn this into this. And then even from this to this, <coughs> you still do need to have intensification to work properly. Okay. But the mess that's going on in there <coughs> is what we're still really trying to, to, we're getting better at understanding, but we're still really trying to get a handle on. This is another way of looking at the same problem. This, 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 what goes on in these to make that? And if you looked at all of those, could you even tell which one of those three does actually That's the operational question, and then it's also the fundamental research question. We know that there are large scale conditions that are necessary for formation to happen. Uh, Ray found these back in 1968. We need thermodynamic conditions, and these are basically the conditions for deconvection. Okay. We also need weak vertical wind shear, and this is also a condition for deconvection, so that the convection isn't tilted over or sheared away. It needs to be away from the equator, we saw that with the tracks. So we need to have non-zero Coriolis. And then we also need to have some sort of enhanced lower tropospheric relative vorticity provided by something. This can be on a fairly large scale, but it's just something that's going to help to start to organize the convection. Things like transient large scale. I threw this in here just because <coughs> you heard a little bit this morning about equatorial waves in the MJO. The transient large scale circulations can help to enhance the environment for cyclogenesis and some phases of the MJO are shown in some regions to um, help cyclogenesis to happen. Some of the types of parent disturbances, monsoon trough, monsoon gyre, these are circulations in the Pacific, in the Australian region, in the western North Pacific. <coughs> this is an example of an ITC, intertropical convergence zone, sheer vorticity where you get a lot of convection happening along the intertropical convergence zone and then this breaks, spontaneously breaks down, it becomes unstable. Development of a lot of vorticity in here, but very thinly stretched in a very um, enhanced area, spontaneously breaks down, and then you've got three tropical cyclones that are basically formed at the same time. See so this mechanism in the Eastern Pacific particularly. Easterly waves, this is a mechanism mostly for the Atlantic, but you do see this in the Pacific as well. Um, easterly waves are formed by an instability um, because of <coughs> the heating over the Sahara Desert. Easterly waves form off a jet and they propagate out over the um, Atlantic at 10 metres per second. They've got a nice little structure. Um, they're a wave, so they have a trough and a ridge and a trough and a ridge. They're about a wavelength of 1,500 to 2,000 kilometres. And in the trough part of that wave, you have an enhanced area of cyclone vorticity. And that's where they typically see cyclones forming in the Atlantic as they come off Africa. You also see this mechanism, the N equals 1 equatorial Rossi wave is a particularly favoured equatorial wave. This is showing you the OLR variance for the N equals 1 ER band, the outgoing long wave radiation. So you see the enhancement here and here, so you have twins across the equator. This is the um, dynamic structure of that, so you have two lows straddling the equator or two highs straddling the equator. And out of this enhanced area of <coughs> cyclonic vorticity, here and here, 
formation of twin cyclones that potentially can help each other to propagate along the equator. Eventually, they're going to move off to the northwest and, and the southwest because they are vorticity packets, they're Rosby wave packets, and so they're going to propagate on the Earth's vorticity gradient eventually, but they can self propagate as well. But there's a couple of twins. That happens occasionally. It's kind of cool when it does. <coughs> Genesis has been talked about as a two stage process, and I think it's a nice paradigm to think about still. In the first stage, you need to precondition the environment so that genesis can happen. This includes setting up an environment and enhanced large scale vorticity, um, enough moisture there so that you start to get some convection. If you get enough um, enhanced convection in there, then you can actually, if this is a nice mesoscale convective system, then you can actually get a new level vortex developing in the stratiform region. The conditions, the environment is right in there to actually allow the stretching of vorticity to actually leave a rotational vorticity in the middle levels of the atmosphere, and that's what this is indicating right here. This now gives you a scale by which you can organize convection on a tropical cyclone scale. And so in the stage two, they have re-initiation re uh, re of convection in this mesoscale vortex, and then you've got a tropical cyclone. So it's kind of your two-stage paradigm for <coughs> Several days, especially this part, you have lots of pulses of convection that's, that's uh, preconditioned in the environment. And then suddenly one will go, and then you'll get this. And it's not necessarily easy to predict when that's going to happen. Um, I am going to show you one example where it happened very quickly. <coughs> so the key questions with cyclogenesis is trying to understand how, when in the ambient tropics you have, and this has been exaggerated, okay, but in the ambient tropics you have. Actually, maybe it's not. Um, you have this Rosby scale. It's a scale on which rotation happens of um, about 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers. What this means is if you have convective activity, so convection generates, it produces a heat anomaly in the atmosphere. It generates um, gravity waves. And those gravity waves all propagate away and propagate that heat energy back away to whatever the Rosby scale. And then you enhance the rotation of so if you only have this, the ambient tropical Rosby um, scale, you get convection forming in here. All that energy is propagated away to this scale. You spin these winds up a teeny tiny bit there. But you don't do anything else. And the question is, how do you go from this scale to this scale? And that's kind of the core of the tropical cyclone scale. So this has kind of been what the key question is. How do you, can, how can you organize convection so it becomes effective on this scale, when in the tropics, the Rosby radius scale is so that's one of the questions. There's a scale problem. The second one is when you do have convection happening, if it's not organized in some way, then it's self-defeating. You have convection form, you have convergence at the surface that's supporting that convection. Then you start to have downdrafts develop. Eventually you get enough precipitation loading in here that you get downdrafts in here as well. Those downdrafts reach the surface and you end up with an anticyclone. So you have to go from...